I'm Matt Byron, and this is the Marketing Strategies Podcast, where I speak with interesting and well-respected marketers from high-growth companies. We'll discuss the strategies they've used to generate traffic, acquire new users, and grow their business. I know on day 30, if you are going to renew or churn on day 365. It's a little bit of mind control. You need to reach the leads in a specific time frame. The faster, the better. You know, when something works, don't do more like it, do more with it. If you're selling to a very finite audience, an inbound model is going to be grossly inefficient. This audience has what top questions, and then make sure that you have an answer to each of their questions. We don't hire professional writers to write for the blog. We hire sales operations practitioners. Whoever gets closest to the customer wins. Thank you all for joining me today for this episode of the Marketing Strategies Podcast. Today, I'm joined by G, a super interesting guy who has been referred to as the mad scientist. He was the head of growth for Mention, then the VP of growth at Segment, before recently joining Drift in the VP of growth role. I'm excited to chat about growth, experiments, marketing, strategies, and more. So let's dive right in. Hey G, how are you doing today, man? Hey Matt, thanks for having me today. Yeah, you're welcome. Really good to have you on. Um, really t- interesting time in your career. Just um, recently joining Drift. Really cool, uh, mm-hmm. really cool product and team they've got over there. Thanks. Yeah, so I guess um, I'd first like to dive into your background. Really interesting, like I said. Um, you know, while researching your career, um, I've been really, really interested and impressed by the number of prominent companies you've worked for at literally the key periods of their growth. And I was just wondering how you feel you've uh, learned and developed your skills as you've, as you've moved through these companies. Yeah, I mean, I think, to be honest, I've been lucky uh, because I... I was a teen in, in the 90s, and I was fortunate enough that uh, my parents could uh, give me at the same time a computer and an internet connection. Um, and I was living in France, and I mean, that's not obvious in, in late 90s. Um, and, and that helped me build a website, uh, and, uh, a non-for-profit, but we actually made some profits in, in that non-for-profit uh, by selling ads in the late 90s. Um, and so I, was, I started my career as a publisher, you know? That's how I started right. publishing content, um, and then moved to Apple for five years. You know, and which means I was at Apple when Apple launched the iPhone. Wow, what a time, hey! And yeah, and those were those were days. You know, those were like I learned a ton. That's my first real job, um, where I learned the most early on in my career. Uh, when I had a mentor, uh, that was at Apple, and I was uh, working on the online Apple Store for businesses which means I was trying to get businesses to buy Apple products online in 2004. And that was a very different time than it is today. We're talking like 14 years ago, you know, yeah. when companies did not want to put their credit card online, when they would, did not want to click on banners, and there was no such thing as uh, the social networks we know about uh, today. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was very lucky to be able to be there. And I think the reason why I think I'm lucky is marketers these days need to learn a lot about a lot of different channels. They need to learn about email, about advertising, about social networks, about content, but they don't have the opportunities to work on all those channels because companies, internet companies are so big, so verticalized, that we're usually going to focus a young marketer on one specific channel, and which means they're going to be, become the expert of email or the expert of advertising. But back in the days, uh, when I started, People are just like tell me to do like marketing on the internet, and that was my <laughs> channel. You know, I was in charge of the internet channel. You know, and and anything was game. You know, and which means I I learned a ton. I added a ton of experience in a way that's really hard to replicate today, unless you are the sole marketer in a really small startups. Uh, that that's where it works. So I mean, that's probably the foundation of my career. And I guess back in the day, there wasn't the broad uh, scope of, you know, um, really sophisticated software or um, really sophisticated um, processes and um, experiments that people uh, run these days. Uh, back in the day, it was really quite simple, um, although, um, you know, st- still still a new technology. It was really quite simple compared to what people do today. Sure. Uh, on the other hand, people often ask me, like, when did you become 
like a growth person. And, and I think, in, in a way, it was at Apple. Because at Apple, when you work in Europe, uh, where I was, um, in marketing, you can't change the price of the product. Of course not. You can't change the name of the product or the packaging or, or whatever, right? You can't change anything because it's Apple, right? Which means your options are fairly limited. Uh, and I still had to generate leads for my salespeople. And my boss at the time, I can say that now because he's retired, uh, Jean-Pierre Gianetti, um, said, no, you know, we're not going to create campaigns because that requires approval from the high-ups and, and you never get approval. We're going to create experiments. Okay. Experiments, we don't need to ask approval for that. We can just do them, we'll get the metrics, and if it works, then we'll ask for approval. What did I know? I mean, I was 20 years old. I said, okay, boss, we're going to do that. Um, of course, that was not how things were supposed to be done, but it worked so well for us. And we were doing <laughs> experiments on experiments, doing things without asking for approval, uh, asking our partners to delay the invoicing, or to not invoice us until we had solid metrics so that we could come and then present with solid metrics. And that's, that's growth hacking. That's awesome. And what sort of experiments were you running back in the day? Um, mostly lead generation, demand generation campaign stuff like we do ads. I mean, I did ads in newspapers, you know, which might sound crazy to some people out here. Uh, but like I, I bought ads in newspapers. I did bundles with like uh, online ads where I would promote the bundle with a Mac and something else because because we're not able to discount the price of the Mac. Okay. We'd actually bundle it with a printer or something else and we'd discount the total product saying that it was not the Mac was discounted, it was the printer, you know? That was like borderline, it, it worked. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that, that we would do. That's cool. And, and obviously I alluded to your pseudonym of the mad scientist. Um, you know, is this, is this when this came about, uh, you know, in the early days of you thinking about ideas and thinking about things that other people didn't, trying and experimenting with different, um, different lead generation tactics, for example? No, I think that's a bit later. I think that's a bit later. Uh, when I left Apple, when Apple moved to London and I stayed in Paris, uh, uh, shortly thereafter, I moved into an IT security company. And so I was the CMO. I was first PM and then CMO uh, for an IT security company. Um, I did um, consulting, uh, pen testing, and stuff like that. And I learned how to work with um, white hat hackers, of course. I also learned a ton about you know the the dark side of the web and and uh, the pen testing and the hackers and social engineering. I learned a ton during those like almost two years. Uh, and I then realized that marketing isn't that far from what you know let's say people who do social engineering do to like convince you that you did win uh, the uh, bill gates lottery right in both cases someone is trying to convince someone else of something through an email um and and of course, one is very different than the other because like the product exists and the other one it doesn't. But still, the approach is interesting. How they do it? How how is it that these businesses survive? How is it that you know they're able to sometimes get you to give your password or your social security number or whatever, right? Because they're able to gain trust. They're able to convince you. Marketing, in some ways, is similar. And so I learned a lot, and. I learned also uh, a lot about how, let's say, the internet works and how I can use that to my advantage. And I think that's when I started to go a bit crazy and more creative, we could say, uh, on marketing. And this is when you were effectively learning your skills, honing your skills on the job in the early days of uh, your, your first, you started mm -hmm. your career, really. Um, I guess when we get to uh, your later career, your more recent career, um, we look at prominent companies like Mention and Segment, and obviously more recently Drift. Yeah. Um, but these companies, for example, yeah. Mention and Segment, you've been at these companies at times of where they've um, achieved rapid growth and they've um, they've really uh, become prominent uh, companies out in the market. How, do you feel like you've influenced those in a, in a big way? Have you been a big part of the, the growth for those businesses? <laughs> I hope so, but I guess you'd have to ask the CEO of Mention and, and Segment for that. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously there's a, for example, Mention, when I came, um, they had no marketing team. They had no analytics, no, no data whatsoever on customers, you know, and the process for the two salespeople uh, to find leads 
was to look in the list of signups of the previous day for about an hour, just scroll through it and find, click on emails that's, that looked interesting. That was the process, right? And then when I left, they had segments installed, they had analytics and tracking on all the actions of the users. There was predictive analytics, a predictive scoring to tell you when people were on the website, which ones uh, were valuable. And when people signed up, there was lead scoring to ping an email automatically the uh, sign up in the name of the right sales rep. So, I mean, yeah, we changed a ton of things during my tenure. And we, I'd say, we increased the, self, the efficiency of sales rep uh, um, by a tenfold at least. And would you, uh, you mentioned sales and marketing there. I know you, uh, some of the articles that, I've, that you've written that I've been re- reading recently talk about that uh, interplay between sales and marketing. How, how would you feel about that? Do you feel that marketing drives sales or do you feel that uh, it's the other way around? How do you feel the interplay works there? It's a very important thing. Yeah, usually it fails, uh, to be honest, you know, so that people who listen to this podcast know. Usually that's a big pain point. Um, I think I've solved it. And I think the way I've solved it is the following. I've created an agreement that goes both ways. Um, Because I'm now able to predict the value of each lead, um, the sales velocity, the expected close rates, and the amount in dollars, I know how many qualified leads we need to reach uh, the sales quota. And I am not the one doing that. I have given the keys to that to a third party company called Mad Kudu. So the third party does the lead qualification, right? And so they are independent. I am not the one making that score. Neither is the sales. And so once they give the score, we know if that lead counts or not, and we know how many leads we need of that quality each month. That's my engagement, my SLA, my service level agreement downwards to the sales. Now, if you look at the revenue, which we are all focused on, you need to reach the leads in a specific time frame. The faster, the better to optimize revenue, which means the sales have an SLA, a service level agreement, upwards to me, right? And the better leads, highest quality, they've got four hours to get to them. If they don't get to them in four hours, uh, they will get redistributed and 24 hours for the top 50%. Otherwise, it means they are detrimental to the value of the leads I'm bringing. And so by having an upwards and a downwards agreement, we now have very little to debate, you know, it's really helpful. Yeah, that's that's super cool. So it's effectively taking all the guesswork and all the um, assumption out of it, and really making it um, a, a science. Really, so you're saying yeah. we're going, we're going, we have so many leads at uh, this score. They're going down to sales. Sales have to um, adhere to their SLA back to us, and then we should get the defined output. Yeah, yeah. it's predictable. You know, the, 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 the whole point of a funnel with solid metrics is that it's predictable, you know? Uh, and it means also marketers should stop doing stupid things. Like, for example, uploading a webinar with like uh, a thousand uh, emails, you know, because there's no intent there. There's those people could work for qualified companies, but it's not because they listen to the webinar that they have the desire to buy the product. Right. And so you need to think it through, you know, if you are optimizing your marketers on leads and leads only, you're going to fail. Yeah. As a CEO. Absolutely. There's no quality there. No, nothing. Um, so, okay, so um, what I'd like to talk about is how you would start growth at a company. So, for example, you recently started at Drift uh, five or so months mm-hmm. ago. Uh, you know, what was your first week like? Where did you begin? What was the first uh, set of actions that you took? What did, where did you look at? And, and how did you start to understand where you could make a real difference to their team? Yeah, so, I mean, it's different for everyone. In my case, I now have... Um, enough experience in um, the vendors that I want that one of them, I've got two it's a main paths that I'm following when I join a new company one is I bring in the vendors I need to succeed and the second thing is I implement tracking none of the companies that have joined in the past five years have had correct tracking implemented 
And what would you like, define you know, the cor- even, correct even track segment, loss? Even segment. Even segment. You gotta you gotta understand that I we implemented with my, with the growth team, we we implemented segment tracking at segment because it was incorrect. How crazy is that? Yeah. <laughs> And what would you define as the right tracking? What, what would be um, your... Yeah, you need to be able to understand what people are doing step by step so that your machine learning that you can apply can predict what are the aha moments. If you're not, if you have product market fit and your tracking does not enable you to discover the aha moment, the magical moment where people see the value and buy, if you can't see it, the machine learning won't see it and you're not going to be able to um, double down on what works. Okay. You won't know what works. You don't know what people are buying or not buying. You, know, you don't know what people are leaving. You know? um, and so that's crazy. Most companies I see, they know nothing. And what would you define as the aha moments? Where would you see those in your analytics? What would be the, the, you know, the flag to say, you know, the customer's happy or the customer wants to do this, for example? Yeah, for, for me, it's really the, the perception of value. It's, it's not when they, so we often talk of activation. I'm not a big fan of that because activation is, it's an internal metric, right? It's like, it's when you think the people perceive value, you know, um, it, it, it's wrong. Like, for example, uh, at segment activation was when people were sending data to segment. Um, but that's, they're not getting value yet because the data stays within segment. It goes nowhere, right? The value gets from when you're actually sending data to segment and then it goes somewhere else into another tool. Same at Drift, you know, we used to count activation as people who have uh, installed RJS, um, but that's wrong. They have value when they have chats and actually that's not true. They get value when those chats actually become leads and they get revenue. Then they perceive the value, which means we need to be able to analyze that perception of value. And there's a few ways to do that, but I prefer to ask people. There's this great psychology hack you can do, which is when people sign up, once they sign up, you add another question after the sign up, which is, what does success look like? What are you trying to achieve? And they can write down, right? Or you can select from like a drop down menu. And then you can map that to what they're doing and bring them back to, hey, now you've achieved your goal. And they have the, that perception, and now they're ready to pay. They can't back down. And you're able to manage that on a mass scale. So for the, the amount of customers that are signing up for Drift, you can tie that back to every customer and speak with that customer uh, specifically. Sure. Or, yeah, and that's done by the sure. sales I mean, team, is it? Or? You, I, I use stuff like Monk Learn to do a natural language passing and just to do like s- simple categorization and uh, tagging of through our text. Uh, it works fairly well. So, yeah. Amazing. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, so I read an article recently that you wrote called uh, Market, Marketing Automation is Broken, and that's exactly why I joined Drift. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about, um, you know, what is it about Drift that uh, you feel can fix marketing automation? Sure. Um, marketing automation, if you think of like the tools like, like uh, Pardot, Marketo, uh, HubSpot, I mean, those were amazing tools. You know, they changed uh, and they made marketing much easier 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know. Uh, the problem nowadays is um, marketing has become way more competitive. Online marketing has been way more competitive. And those tools now are kind of legacy tools. They're not flexible enough. They, are, they, they, they don't use uh, latest technology, cutting edge technology. Um, and so they are becoming increasingly complex. And they are actually optimizing you, the marketer. They're pushing you to lower the costs um, and to have a lot and a lot of contacts, talk to a lot of people at the same time. So they're trying to push you to do mass scale marketing with very little value to the user. It's basically send the same message to everyone in the same stage. And I hate that because people are different. Each and every individual is different, have dif- have, has different needs, um, and has different pains and perceptions about you know, how they're going to solve that pain. And your product can be seen from different angles. And pushing the same message in the same way at the same moment to everyone is just an awful customer experience. It's awful. You know? And that's what those tools are doing. They helped us get to a point where at least we're saying something to the customers, but now we can do so much more. 
now we can actually create a more personalized experience by learning about the customer and actually having conversations with them. The point of Drift is we want you to have more revenue with less emails, less conversations. Just talk to the right people at the right moment. I'm not here to um, push you to do massive email campaigns. I think that's the, a bad idea. My goal is to help you help my customers be successful in bringing more revenue by doing less. That's my goal. And I guess that, like you said, makes it a personal communication with the, the people that you're speaking mm -hmm. to. So less conversations, more personal, more value. And so it's really bringing it back to, um, you know, before marketing automation systems came out, really, it's, it's bringing it back to the personal communication that you would get into a retail store or something like that, but actually for the online experience. Exactly. Yeah, the retail store is, 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 is the great uh, example, especially the Apple retail store, which, which we love as an example. Um, I think the point of a drift is we're bringing it back. We're trying to emulate, simulate that experience online, that quality experience, with the tools to make it manageable. If it's just, hey, you should talk to everyone and you're on your own, that's not helpful. All right? um, we are creating the tools, the machine learning, the natural language processing, the integrations with other partners to pull in the right data to help you be extremely efficient and i'd say automate what can be automated and let you the human focus on the conversation absolutely that's cool that's super cool and um what's it what's your vision for the future of drift where do you th see this going in the next five or so years what would be the next steps yeah um I mean, five, five years is, is a long time, so I, I can be pretty pretty bold about that <laughs> one. Um, five years from now, I'd see Drift replacing a good chunk of the Salesforce. I'm not taking, not talking of Salesforce, the company, though we could, but I'm talking of Salesforce in two words, the people who are sales. Um, a lot of what those people are doing, especially the top of the funnel, the SDR, sales development reps, and BDRs, uh, business development reps, what they do is not super qualitative, right? They are optimized to place a ton of calls, send a ton of emails of low value. And we're paying those humans to do that. And it's it's a pretty lame job. Um, and I think we can help those people focus on where they're good, which is having conversations. They have the businesses, at say, displace those jobs with good automation. I think the difference is that this year, probably 2018, we'll be able to send the first batch of emails to the right people at the right time with the right message. But we won't be able to answer, right? Because that requires a lot of, of NLP and, and ML. Five years from now, however, there's going to be a shift. The shift is going to be right now, as a human, you, Matt, you perceive an email you get from a human when you're convinced that it's human as having a higher face value than an automated email. Yeah. Correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Why is that? Well, you feel why like do you, you value. Well, why is it? Yeah, you feel like you're dealing is with it a person. Because that, yeah, but like, why do you think that it's more valuable? Is it because past experience informs you that the automated email is bad? Or is it because you feel for the human that has... Uh, shedded tears and sweat to buy the email. Yeah, I mean, you feel like you've got uh, somebody's got a personal connection there. They're making uh, mm -hmm. assumptions and advice and giving you help to to support yeah. you through your journey, really. So, I guess that's that's <clears throat> what it might be. <laughs> so that's I think the big thing in five years. I think in five years we won't care who's sending the message. We'll just look at them at the face value of the message. Does that message, whichever the channel, does that message? bring me value is it valuable to me is the information in there valuable am i learning something is it helping me and if it is i don't care if it's a human or a bot that's impos that impersonating a human or just a bot i don't care yeah. if it's super relevant and if you it's know, bringing you that's, value i think the tipping that's what's going to change and once that change happens everything the whole playing field is going to change because then you don't need all those salespeople. 
right? Because we need the salespeople just because right now we're not able to advocate the data in an email and because there's this higher perception of value. But when that changes, imagine the consequences. Yeah, and you can be brought value. You can be helped without even a human being involved. Uh-huh. Awesome. So um, we've got quite deep into that. I'd, I'd like to bring it back to sort of <laughs> <laughs> to the, the uh, like growth uh, strategies. And, and if, if you were to look sure. at, um, for, for example, the listeners who are starting out in growth and they, they, they have a business, it might be a product business, a service business, a SaaS business. Um, where would you start? Would you, would you uh, map out the customer journey and walk through all the different areas that you can find where you can improve, add value um, and bring the, the, the test different growth experiments for example so that you can actually uh, try things and, and is that where you would start yeah yeah definitely i always try to like create a funnel and then i try to look in that funnel for what's leaking you know um and try to because I, I know like the industry metrics i know from past experience you know the different conversion rates in the funnel and so when I look at a funnel, I can say, hey, here, we can do 2x, here we can do 3x. Or maybe there, there's not much to win, you know? Um, for example, uh, ad drift or close rate is way higher than the industry. And so there's no point in trying to optimize it, you know? When you see a higher close rate, it's telling you one thing, you need more leads, you know? Um, and sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes, you know, you see a company with like a lot of leads and super low close rate. That means that they need some lead qualification. Yeah. So, you know, looking at the metrics really helps you understand you know, what recommendations you need to make. And which uh, software tools would you actually use to map out the, um, the journey on, on, on that basis as the funnel? I, yeah, usually, uh, so my tracking is done with segments. Um, and the actual analytics, I do it with Amplitude. Amplitude. Yeah. Okay, cool. Really good tool. And, that's and it's free until 10 million events, which is pretty darn good. Okay, cool. And is that some, similar to like Heap or Kiss Metrics, for example? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, very similar. Cool. And then you can just map out each, each, uh, each section, each uh, stage in the funnel and literally you'll look at the uh, metrics see if you know if they're higher or lower than industry standard and then that's how you'd actually know which areas to focus on uh, and run experiments for example exactly and what er experiments would you start with how would you actually decide which experiments to run for each each area how would you prioritize yes so uh, usually uh, so i use the, the growth framework which is called ic the impact confidence and ease from growthhackers.com from sean ellis um and i tried to make estimates about you know what's the what's the potential impact of that experiment how long is it going to take us to build it um what's what's the risk factor um and so looking at that we then like prioritize the right experiment so it can be sending cold emails it can be um, you know, improving the sign-up flow. Uh, there's many different things. Uh, but I usually work with a PM and an engineer where once we understand the experiment, we try to rank it, each of us, uh, and then we try to come into an agreement on, on you know, what, what, what the actual estimate should be. Okay, and then you'll aim to improve or um, test different scenarios to see if you can actually yeah. get better. But you know what? The... The, I'd say the most important thing is not being really good at uh, having ideas. It's easy to have ideas. What's really important is to test a lot of things. Right. Well, I mean, I talk with a lot of growth people around, a lot of growth people. And what's the one defining metric that, that is tied to success? It's the number of experiments you went a week. Okay. If you're able to run more experiments, just by the nature of things, you're going to find success. It's, it's just a matter of time. You know, in my case, I, I usually succeed like between one out of three times to one out of seven times, you know, um, maybe three out of 10, you know, and, and it's the same for all the other folks that I know, you know, uh, because growth is experimental. If you're succeeding like 70% of the time, 90% of the time, you're not a growth team. You're a product team. And I mean, that's fine. I, I have nothing to say against product teams. It's just like, you're not experimental. The point of growth is that you're here to fail. 
you forget to fail. And if you fail fast, you can move on and you can try something else. If you take a month to fail, then that means there's only 12 experiments. You've got only 12 bets per year. And yeah. that means you're going to think a lot. It means you're going to weigh your, your chances a lot and you're no longer a growth team. You're not moving fast. So you got to move fast. You got to test two or three things per week. And is that how many um, different things you're testing at the moment in, in uh, Drift, for example? Yeah. yeah. So unfortunately for me, I, I usually tend to test a lot more than what I, can, that what I or my team can do. So uh, we, I usually like overshoot what's actually possible. But yes, <laughs> I usually have a lot of, 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 of uh, irons in the fire at the same time um, because I'm not smarter than other people and I'm not faster than other people. It's not true. You know? I just try to have multiple projects open at the same time. You know, it's the opposite uh, of like being focused. I'm not focused because being focused means I do one thing at a time and do it well. But like in my case, it just I can't do that because otherwise I'm not going to go fast enough. And so I have maybe ten different projects open at the same time, and I have other people, I have other partners or third parties working on them slowly. But that means that you know every week I can get you know a. Th- a project that's like three week long, you know, three times a week. Yeah, so you're learning constantly, learning from uh, rapid rapid testing, really. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And how do you uh, track and um, keep uh, organized all the different growth experiments with re- with um, scenarios and results, um, hypothesis, for example? How do you keep track of everything? Yeah, I use um, a Growth Hackers project. Uh, so growthhackers.com, it's a community. They also have this uh, SAS tool, which is called Projects. Yes. Um, where you can input all the theories, all the hypotheses, and all the results in a knowledge base. It's pretty good. Yeah, and that you, that's that works for you. Keep track of everything in there. Yeah. 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 Amazing. That's that's great to know. And how how important is um, SEO in in your growth landscape? Uh, it used to be huge. Uh, these days, much less. Um, I think SEO as opt- as pure optimization is kind of slowly going away, whereas now it's really good content that's dominating. Yeah. And the reason for that is Google is just becoming better and better at finding if your content is good by itself. You know, it doesn't need you to give you all the metadata. It doesn't give. You, I mean, I mean, it, ten years ago we were like optimizing metadata. Uh, five years ago, we were optimizing like rich snippets. Yes. Um, and now, none of that. You know, Google is just finding its way around. But if we do great content, we we do get a lot of good traffic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, quality content wins over everything these days, and it's hard to actually um, know if you're creating the the perfect content. It's just got to offer a lot of value, really. Um, yeah. that, that's what. But you know when you're there. Yes. That's the point. You know when you. you, you the problem is that when you're not there, you don't know what to do. Once you're there, it's, it's kind of a weird conundrum. Once you're there, you see it. And it, you cannot miss it. You know, at Drift, that clearly is this like, great content uh, and this great traction, great traffic. Why is that? It's not obvious. You know, at what point, it, what changed? But now we found the recipe and we're, we're baking the same thing every day. Yeah, and you just feel like you're on a growth trajectory these days. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, that's exactly the the place you want to be, really. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So over the years, over the last few years, what uh, marketing strategies have you attri- would you attribute to your biggest wins? Um, I think things around um, email. And taking a step back is actually predicting um, ahead of my competitors uh, who we should talk to about what topic and when. Um, so moving from being reactive, which is mo- most where most companies are, where most of my competitors are, they react to people coming to the website. They're very reactive. I try to be predictive. I try to predict who's in the market, who's interested, what's their pain point, how much are they willing to pay, and I try to reach out to them before even they think about coming to me. Because then the cost is much lower and I've got no competitors. And so, I mean, sure, like 
I do cold uh, down, cold emails of that. But I, I get like open rates of 80%, response rates in the 15% way above what most people get it's because it's super high quality content yeah it's super high quality content it's valuable it's the right time it's the right person it's not spammy and um, so yeah um you could think of it as just email i think of it as being very predictive so personal email is, is literally what you would attribute your biggest win to personally uh, yeah yeah for, for for sure uh emails um as for drift Drift has been very successful uh, with uh, awareness and inbound channels, uh, podcasts, social media, uh, blog posts, um, just delivering great content every day. That, that's uh, how Drift grew and a bit of uh, referral. Okay. So the inbound marketing um, way of life, really? Well, yeah. I mean, Drift was founded by uh, people who formerly were at HubSpot. So, I mean, inbound marketing is that thing. Absolutely. And do you guys, you guys have um, a dedicated content creation team internally as well? Yeah. Yeah, that's like one of our strongest teams is the marketing team. Yeah. Um, yeah. And do you guys use a content calendar then to keep track of everything that you do day by day? Yeah, they, they do have a content calendar. I'm not part of that team, so I'm not super aware of how they do it. But yeah, they definitely have a calendar. Will you test experiments on actually promotion, the promotion of content as well, or actually, or like maybe their landing pages and things as well? No, we don't promote content. We don't. We, I mean, it's kind of weird to say that we don't need to. No. No, we don't need to. It, it, it just the audience it just is there. works. I mean, if we have the right, yeah, yeah. I mean, then we have. I mean, everyone's super engaged. Like our CEO posts stuff, like videos, like one minute videos on LinkedIn. We get three hundred upvotes and like 80 comments on each of those posts that's awesome and they can milk those posts for like leads yeah but like how many ceos are willing to do that yeah you're in a great position there <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so looking forward to 2018 we've obviously just started um, what's important for you what's on your radar what things do you still have to test and uh, what's coming up for you um, I mean, for me, I drift building the growth team. That's probably the biggest challenge, uh, hiring the right people um, to build the best growth, B2B growth team in San Francisco with me. That's my biggest challenge. Um, I think for the market is the explosion of MarTech. You know, if you know that, that, that slide uh, with like the 5,000 logos, yes. <laughs> uh, that's becoming a problem. Because now, I mean, we didn't have any choice. I mean, it was, and this was like East Germany like 10 years ago, right? Where we had like, you wanted like one enrichment vendor, you went to DNB, and that was it. You know, now there's like hundreds of those. Yeah. And, and you don't know how to choose anymore. That's becoming a problem. And so it has expanded like the universe. Now it needs to contract a bit again. You know, there's just too many options, too many of those vendors on just not going to cut it, even financially, even if the product is good. And you feel like might, no, there might for that. be a reduction in the amount of SaaS companies out there over the next few years? It has to. It has to. There's just too many options right now. And like, they are going to be some winners and some losers. Yeah, I guess with everything really as well. Um, I mean, you mentioned yeah. uh, previously that you bring in vendors as well as uh, actually growing things yeah. internally. Is this so you would actually use external uh, agencies and uh, teams and resources, or is this like uh, other software products and things that you would bring in? It's it, it's more software products, though. I do outsource a lot of my projects, crazy project engineering, to those uh, software products because those teams usually are, are happy to to work with me. Uh, to to create uh, better products. Okay. What what type of uh, companies do you work with? Sure, I work with uh, Xerbit, uh third party data. Uh, data. Yeah. Uh, great great data vendor. I work with Madkudu, which I've named before for leads going. I work with Zapier for um, yes. automation. Amazing. I work with MonkeyLearn uh, for um, very simple uh, machine learning as a service. Uh, I work with Intelomize. Um, who does uh, web optimization, one-to-one -one web, uh, web optimization on our site. Uh, segment, of course, through the data tracking amplitude. We talked about that for the BI. 
uh, HUL.io, H-U-L-L, -L, uh, which is an uh, ETL and a CDP customer data platform. Uh, really great to like, bring all of the uh, all of those data sources in, in one central repository. Um, Datanize, to know more about the technologies uh, of a company. Um, man, so many companies, you know, <laughs> so many. It's good to get the insight, though. I appreciate you really enough. A few companies there, uh, quite a number I've heard of, but a few I haven't. Uh, a few I know that you work with as well, so that's really interesting. But I'll certainly check a few of those out. So it's been uh, fantastic and uh, really interesting talking to you today, Jay. Um, looks like we're coming up to our last five questions here. So if you're ready. Awesome. <laughs> ready. Okay, so um, what's your best piece of marketing advice? Do it your way. Don't learn from others, but don't replicate. Do your own stuff. What works for someone else will not work for you. If you do what others do, how can you win over them? Absolutely. And learn from things that don't work and things that do work as well, I guess. Mm -hmm. And can you recommend a book to our listeners? Yeah, my go-to book is Influence by Cialdini uh, to learn psychology. Uh, and marketing is everything about psychology. Cool. And what software tool couldn't you live without? Clibit. If Clibit goes down, I go back farming potatoes. <laughs> yes. I use Clibit. It is awesome. Uh, and anybody who hasn't should definitely yeah. check it out. Yeah. And what's your favorite example of a marketing campaign? Oh, my favorite one? Uh, man, uh, Apple's Think Different campaign. Yeah, it's a big one. Yeah, that's my favorite, for sure. <laughs> and which other podcast do you listen to and should we listen to? Uh, Seeking Wisdom. Um, we actually do that podcast. Uh, we don't talk about the product, but we invite uh, CEOs who share their 20, 30 years of experience, um, any execs, and it's a great podcast to learn faster. You know, podcasts, books, content, it's about learning from other people's mistakes. I think that's probably the last word is you only have 24 hours. You can't create more time. There's only one way to be better, to go faster, is to learn from others who have done it. And, and a podcast, a book, or whatever the medium is, that's how you do it. I couldn't agree more. Thanks very much for your wise words today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And I'd encourage everyone to check out Drift and um, take a trial and listen again to the next podcast. Thanks, Matt. Thank you all for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share with your friends. I would also be extremely grateful if you could rate and review us on iTunes or the channel you get this podcast through. Next week, I'm joined by Andy Crestadina, who is the co-founder of Orbit Media. Andy explains how they've grown their blog to millions of views and how they use the authority of their blog not to generate leads directly, but to rank for very difficult keywords. It's a really interesting chat, and I know you'll get value from it. So, until next time, I've been your host, Matt Byram.